welcome all of you very welcome and here in this segment in this segment what we would try to understand is we have a segment on the 2019 uh, zoology paper will be saying the biology the segment related to zoology questions will be uh, saying now uh, to jump into the discussion to begin with the first question extrusion extrusion of second polar body from egg nucleus occurs at which stage is the question right the question is to be clear extrusion extrusion of second polar body from egg nucleus occurs if you recall by the process of oogenesis how many polar bodies will form so we have the formation of two polar bodies yes we have the formation of two polar bodies this yes, what are the so called polar bodies these are nothing but minute cells these are nothing but the minute cells two polar bodies will form in the process of oogenesis oogenesis now the question is now asking about the second polar body when does first polar body forms the first polar body right the first polar body the first polar body it forms when primary oocytes are transformed into secondary oocytes in meiosis 1 yes in meiosis 1 process yes the meiosis 1 is happening as the primary oocytes transformed into secondary oocytes secondary oocyte one of the secondary oocyte is actually the minute cell it's actually the minute cell and this minute cell is the first polar body now this secondary oocyte starts undergoing right so starts undergoing the meiosis 2 starts undergoing the meiosis so as it undergoing the meiosis 2 it gets arrested right so it gets arrested at which stage at metaphase it gets arrested at the metaphase it gets arrested at this stage now at this stage only the ovulation will takes place right at this stage only the ovulation will take place now the question is when does the formation of second polar body will happen when will it be extruded when will it be extruded extruded is extrusion is the sending it out expelling it out of the egg now when does it happen when does it happen here is after the entry of sperm before the fertilization right before the entry of the sperm is into the ovum no simultaneously with the first cleavage no it is not so it is also not correct after entry of sperm but before the fertilization right so here whatever the egg that is being released is the secondary oocyte the fertilization cannot happen with the secondary oocyte so that is why as the sperm enters as the sperm enters the egg egg now this suspended or arrested suspended or arrested meiosis 2 division will be resumed will be resumed and then the second polar body will form and as well as the ovum and the ovum will be fertilized leading to the formation of the zygote yes and the second polar body is now extruded extruded after the entry of the sperm so the right choice will be c for us so the same question all of many of these questions many of these questions, almost at least 80% of the questions have been taken directly from ncert books i i i have given the class and page numbers for your benefit so in this discussion okay, you don't need to be worrying so much about that so you get much better information in here anyway so now so after the entry of sperm but before fertilization and we'll see what has been given in the ncert if you see that here you know the secretions of the acrosome so we know what the secretions of acrosome contains it contains the enzymes 
it contains the enzymes such as hyaluronidase acrosin enzymes what do they do they help the sperm enter into the cytoplasm of the ovum by breaking by breaking the zona pellucida and as well as plasma membrane so as they enter into the cytoplasm right as they enter into the cytoplasm it induces the completion of the meiotic division what meiotic division just now we have seen second meiotic division second meiotic division of the secondary oocyte resulting in the formation formation of second polar body and haploid ovum and if you recall if you recall the oogenesis is the unequal division and the spermatogenesis is the equal division that means all the cells that are being produced in this spermatogenesis are equal cells that means uh, in the configuration in the content in the content they are all same but in here in the case of oogenesis they are not same right? they are not same and one cell is much bigger another cell is much smaller yes so that uh, that has to be understood okay so that is uh, the so all this further discussion will help you in your uh, neat exams because majority of the questions are asked from the previous papers as well so if you and if you understand the question in its entirety right not just answers if you understand the question in its entirety so that it will be useful for you in your further exams okay that is uh, one thing that we have and um, the next question so hopefully we are clear about that in the next question due to increasing airborne allergens allergens and pollutants pollutants many people in urban areas are suffering from respiratory disorder causing wheezing due to what so here what is happening is uh, you know urban areas are heavily getting polluted yes all this polluting agents right the dust particles and other chemicals that are there which are spewed by all these automobiles automobiles and as well as construction dust all of these are the pollutants and these pollutants are also allergens what does allergens do these allergens cause the allergies right so when you have the allergy obviously you will have the inflammation right we will have the inflammation whenever there is an allergy you will have the inflammation and since uh, inflammation uh, you can and where does this inflammation is happening is most of the times this inflammation happens in the respiratory pathway that is respiratory uh, conducting pathway that we have so inflammation that is happening in the bronchi and bronchioles bronchi and bronchioles is the right choice for us proliferation of fibrous tissue and it can also will happen you know um, in uh, heavy uh, industries such as coal industry and silica dust uh, so all these cases we can have the development of fibrous tissue in the lungs in the lungs not necessarily in the tubes itself and it might also develop but uh, there are cases where it has developed in the lungs and reduction in the secretion of surfactants so it is also not right choice and benign growth of mucus lining of the uh, nasal cavity benign growth is uh, less growth less growth of mucus lining but sufficient growth is not there in the nasal cavity so it can also it can also be not right choice but given uh, given in the all the all the four choice so it will be which will be your better choice will be the inflammation of bronchi and bronchioles so the statement as it is is not there uh, in ncrt however uh, you can uh, derive the indirect uh, uh, you can derive the indirect indirect uh, understanding from ncrt uh, definition so it is there in your uh, human health and disease lesson class 12 page 153 153 so what they have mentioned here is because of the increased pollutants the people in the urban areas are developing allergies and asthma asthma due to sensitivity to the environment so why does it happen is because in the early life in the early life they are protected from the environment they are living in right so they are always so when in the households they have this closed they live closed indoors indoors and as well you know uh, they as they go out they they travel in cars as they rarely come out they rarely come out that's why in this protected environment they are not exposed and when they are suddenly exposed to these pollutants pollutants which are uh, increasing nowadays in, in such a such rampant manner 
such a rampant manner so that is why you know the path uh, the path which is getting affected here is the respiratory path respiratory path as a result of that there will be inflammation of bronchi and bronchioles bronchi and bronchioles so that is your answer here and the art summit the art summit held in rio de janeiro in 1992 so rio de janeiro is in brazil is in brazil so uh, why does it connected so why was it conducted right so why was this art summit in rio de janeiro was conducted it's a it is also a question that is directly taken from ncrt if you see to assess the threat posed by native species uh, to native species by invasive weed species no uh, there is no convention for this you know uh, overall biodiversity conservation uh, conventions are there but uh, uh, there are there are methods there are uh, methods to to prevent the native species from the invasive species you know we have an example where the cat species which have been introduced from africa have posed problem to the indigenous fishes indigenous species right so that is an example that we have for this you know the invasive species invading the native species but there is no convention here and there is a convention for the second option for immediate steps to discontinue the use of chlorofluorocarbons that were damaging the ozone layer that were damaging the ozone layer so there is a convention here right there is this montreal protocol montreal protocol montreal which is in canada canada where this convention has taken place convention has taken place to reduce to reduce the uh, to reduce uh, the uh, instruments or devices which uh, which release which release chlorofluorocarbons and to reduce the co2 emissions CO2 emissions and global warming and this uh, is related to Kyoto Protocol not necessarily the Earth Summit so this is the Kyoto Protocol Kyoto is in Japan and conservation of biodiversity and sustainable utilization of its resources so it is the right choice for us right conservation of biodiversity and sustainable utilization sustainable use of its benefits benefits and where do we find this uh, you know question uh, is in ncrt class 12 page number 267 in the environmental issues lesson environmental issues lesson in the ecology part towards the end of the ecology and here you can uh, go about this paragraph there is historical convention on biological diversity so this historical convention is art summit so held in rio de janeiro in 1992 so what was the purpose of this convention is so it has called upon all nations all nations to take appropriate measures for the conservation of biodiversity and sustainable sustainable utilization of its benefits okay so we are taking the comprehensive understanding of each question each question so that it would you would be benefiting immensely out of this discussion now uh, if you take the fourth question so this question has been asked from the evolution lesson evolution and evolution of man particularly so this is a segment of evolution of man there will most of the times will be a question on evolution of man so it's better for you to be uh, reading this again and again and various aspects related to it as well i'll discuss this briefly now now homo habilis homo habilis these are all called hominids hominids are you know human like human like uh, beings hominids all of these are the hominids now homo habilis so we are asked about the brain sizes so this brain sizes are otherwise are also called as the cranial sizes the cranial sizes the cc stands here that the cranial size now homo habilis homo habilis uh, what is the cranial size of this being is that is 650 to 800 right 650 to 800 cranial size is there uh, are not necessarily cranial size or the cranial capacity right cc is the cranial size or the cranial capacity also we can call it so it gives the same meaning and neanderthal man are the homo homo neanderthalensis neanderthal man are the homo neanderthalensis so what is the cranial size of this being is so it is uh, it is 1400 cc that is 1400 cranial capacity so it's directly given in ncrt so there is uh, no doubt about it 
Homo erectus, Homo erectus is 900 cc. Homo sapiens, it's not necessarily mentioned, but there is slight reduction in the case of Homo sapiens. That is 1050 cc is the cranial size. It could be due to the highly, uh, highly convoluted, uh, highly convoluted uh, brain. Uh, all this gyra and salsi, the brain uh, region could have been the reason where we have 1350 cc. Okay, so these are the four options. Based on this, uh, you can identify option A is the right choice for us. Right, option A is the right choice. If you see here, if you see here, so this entire paragraph is very important for you. So you, you better remembering each line of it. I'll tell you which which parts of it is very important. Right, the Homo habilis. So when you study the Homo habilis, so the important point for you to be remembering is the cranial capacities. Right, the cranial capacities and one more important point is they probably did not eat meat their food habits also sometimes is being mentioned in the statement related questions right so they, pro they probably did not eat meat and as well fossils discovered in java fossil discovered in java that is java is the place or an island which is there in indonesia indonesia in 1891 reveal the next stage that is homo erectus homo erectus you can see the cranial size here right so that is 900 cc 900 cc and they ate meat so you are seeing the difference here right homo habilis did not eat meat and but the homo erectus ate meat yes so you need to see you need to see the difference and neanderthal man Neanderthal man, so with a brain size of 1400 cc. So you can see the large brain size lived in East and Central Asia, right? East Asia and Central Asia. So the, the locations where they have lived is also very important. Okay, so that is between uh, between 100,000 and 40,000 years back. Okay, so all of these are very important. The point that I highlighted also need to be kept in mind uh, for your benefit in the upcoming NEET exam. Now, the next question that we have is, how does steroid hormones influence the cellular activities? Right, if you take the hormones, hormone classification, if you remember, right, hormone classification, we have all these hormones such as, you know, these amino acid derivatives. Yes, amino acid derivatives. So then what we have? We have the peptide hormones. We have peptide hormones. Then we have say protein hormones. Then we have steroid hormones. Steroid hormones example that is progesterone, estrogen, all of this. And idothyronines which has a function similar with the steroid hormones. Now, the mechanism of action for these different types of hormones is different. So, you know, for steroid hormones, it is very different. And for the peptide and amino acid and protein hormones, it is different. How it is different is, you know, the receptors, hormones are very specific uh, in their function. The receptors that are present for the say amino acid uh, uh, derivative hormones is different. The receptors are present in uh, are on the plasma membrane on the plasma membrane, but the receptors for the steroid hormones, right? Receptors for the steroid hormones they are present in in the cell, right? In the cell in the cytoplasm. So that is where this hormone receptor complex will happen will happen right so uh, in the case of this amino acid hormones say peptide hormones the hormone receptor complex will happen on the plasma membrane and there is generation of these molecules called as secondary messenger molecules where this information is transmitted to them right so you are seeing this activating cyclic amp right so this is for the amino acid hormones not the steroid hormones so how does the steroid hormones is so binding to dna and forming a gene receptor sorry gene hormone complex so uh, this is your right choice. So you can see this uh, option, page 340 of class 11 of NCRT book. You can see, I'll just read up the description that we have, uh, the same description that we have in our NCRT uh, book. So hormones which interact with the intracellular receptors. Example that we have is the steroid hormones and as well as hydrothyronines. Hydrothyronines mostly regulate mostly regulate the gene expression 
are the chromosome function by interaction of hormone receptor complex with the genome. So that's what we are seeing here, right? Binding to DNA and forming a gene hormone complex. So cumulative biochemical actions result in physiological and developmental uh, effects. Developmental effects. Yes, that is your right choice. So the question is from chemical control and coordination. Now, expressed sequence tags refers to. So what do we mean by expressed sequence tags? Right? We need to identify what are the expressed sequence tags. So is it DNA polymorphism, a novel DNA sequence, are genes expressed as RNA? And what is one more option for us? That is polypeptide polypeptide expression polypeptide expression so among the given options as a matter of fact so genes expressed as rna is the right choice you know so if you take the uh, dna so this question has been taken from uh, this dna fingerprinting right dna fingerprinting uh, part of the uh, sixth lesson of ncrt so if you take uh, you know uh, this segment is there in page 119 of the NCRT class 12 book. So when the question has arisen, when the question has arisen uh, to sequence the DNA, to sequence the DNA and which methods to follow was debated upon, which method to follow. And some of the experts have suggested the method of only sequencing the uh, DNA, which has the coding functions and some have suggested the blind approach of sequencing the entire DNA. So entire DNA. So in this segment, you would see the uh, question that has been asked in 2019. So one of this approach, right? We are seeing two approaches here. One approach is to sequence the uh, sequence the DNA, that is coding DNA. And other approach is the blind approach of sequencing entire DNA, regardless whether it's coding are not coding so dna we have two kinds of dna there is coding dna and then there is non-coding dna and one approach one approach of dna fingerprinting that means one method of sequencing of dna finger fingerprinting focused on identifying all the genes that are expressed as rna from the dna to rna and we call it them as expressed sequence tags so that's what we are seeing here right so genes expressed as the rna Right? The, the so-called genes are nothing but all we have the basis of the DNA. Okay, so that that means solution C, that is C, is the right choice for us. The genes which are expressed as RNA are also called as expressed sequence tags or ESTs. Now, the seventh question. So this has been taken from the ecosystem ecology of the lesson in the ecosystem. You know, we will see the ecological pyramids ecological pyramids which of the following ecological pyramids are generally inverted generally inverted most of the times the pyramids are upright pyramids are upright and some situations they can also be inverted that means you get the inverted pyramids so in which situation pyramid of biomass in forest you know pyramid of biomass in forest not necessarily because you know the producers are more in number that is why you'll have more biomass at the bottom at the bottom producers will have more of it so that is why it's not inverted and pyramid of biomass in c right pyramid of biomass in c and as well as pyramid of numbers in the grassland even in the grassland also producers are more that is where the numbers these huge numbers are there it is also not inverted there and pyramid of biomass c in c is the right choice why is that is you know in the c the primary producers are the plankton particularly the phytoplankton phytoplankton are the primary producers and the phytoplankton are fed are fed upon by the sea the sorry fed upon by the uh, extremely sorry there the fed upon by the fish right phytoplankton are fed upon by the fish and fish numbers are more that is why as a result of that fish biomass will be more uh, as a result of that the pyramid is inverted as a result of that the pyramid is inverted Yes, so that is so. He, uh, this is the direct question that has been taken uh, from phase number two forty nine of the NCERT class twelve book. So you can clearly see here the direct statement. So the pyramid of biomass in a sea is generally inverted because the biomass of fishes, biomass of fishes, far exceeds that of phytoplankton. Right? 
far exceeds that of phytoplankton plankton as a result of that the pyramid is inverted and the next question that we have is select the correct sequence for the transport of sperm cells in the male reproductive system right select the correct sequence for the transport of sperm cells in the male reproductive system is the question so uh, transport of cells will happen with the duct system of the male reproductive system if you recall the male reproductive system the primary sex organs testes are located extra abdominally extra abdominally and they have to be brought to the abdominal region abdominal region uh, from the extra abdominal scrotal sac right it, uh, for them to be bringing uh, to that uh, abdominal region we have the duct system so we need to identify the correct sequence of the duct system if you see the first option we have the seminiferous tubules where the production is happening okay but it has taken vasa efferentia no no from the seminiferous tubules it goes to a duct called rete testis so this has been ruled out testis testis to epididymis again so in between we have two ducts here rete testis and vasa efferentia so this also has been ruled out and testis and epididymis right testis and epididymis again same as this it has also has been ruled out now d option option d seminiferous tubules yes in the testis we have the seminiferous tubules seminiferous tubules where there is production of the gametes from the seminiferous tubules it is taken to rete testis yes uh, from there to vasa efferentia vasa efferentia to epididymis from the epididymis to vas deferens vas deferens and then to ejaculatory duct and then to urethra ultimately to the external opening so that is urethral meatus Retinal meatus. So this is the sequence. So this is the correct sequence. As a matter of fact, this has been taken as it is from the NCERT book. If you take page number forty-three in the human reproduction lesson, so the path has been clearly mentioned. We'll just go through this path. So you are seeing the seminiferous tubules here, so which are part of the testis, internal anatomy of the testis. Seminiferous tubules we have here, and they open into the vasa efferentia. So it's not the second duct. Please to mind. Through rete testis, through rete testis, as a result of that, you know you can see the rete testis is the second second duct, yes, and rete testis opens into the vasa uh, efferentia, vasa efferentia, right? Now this vasa efferentia, so vasa efferentia leaves the testis. This is also very important. Among all these ducts, all these ducts which are intratesticular, which are extratesticular, right? These two ducts, rete testis and the vasa efferentia. Are intratesticular ducts that present within the testis. That's why intratesticular. And as well, the duct which leaves the testis also is very important. Right? The duct which is leaving the testis is vasa efferentia. Vasa efferentia duct is the duct which is leaving the testis. And where does it open into? It open into the epididymis. So the sequence is very essential. Uh, please do remember because the questions will be asked from previous chapters. And if you understand the questions in their entirety, you'd bet you'd benefit immensely, right? So we cannot emphasize this point uh, more number of times. Now epididymis. So epididymis present on the posterior surface of each testis. So we'll have this bulb-like epididymis uh, glands rather. They are present on the testis now this epididymis epididymis leads to vas deferens vas deferens is the next duct that we have so this vas deferens actually ascends right so this ascends that means it goes up into the abdomen it goes up into the abdomen and loops over the urinary bladder loops over the urinary bladder and it receives a duct from the seminal vesicles yes it receives a, a duct from seminal Vesicles, seminal vesicles are the accessory reproductive glands. So when they receive the duct from seminal vesicles, and this duct gets united with this vas deferens, now the duct that has formed newly is called as the ejaculatory duct. Ejaculatory duct, we call it, and this ejaculatory duct opens into the urethra. It opens into urethra. Males have the longest urethra when you compare with the females. Yes, it has to travel. In the copulatory organ, that is testis, right? So it has the longest urethra, and this urethra, right? This urethra, uh, you know, uh, opens into the external opening, opening to external opening, that is urethral meatus. Urethral meatus. So uh, yes, I have highlighted, as I have highlighted, all these uh, ducts are very important. So please uh, 
uh, you know uh, make a uh, mental remembrance yes please keep in mind the sequence of the ducts now match the following hormones with respect to disease and if you uh, remember the chemical coordination uh, you know in a better way you would easily answer this question as well direct and CRT diseases they have been uh, mentioned have been mentioned here now when you take the insulin so insulin is the hormone insulin is the hormone released by the pancreas now this insulin hormone uh, lack of it lack of it causes the disease called as diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus and what is this disorder called as diabetes insipidus so it is due to lack of this hormone called as vasopressin or anti-diuretic hormone then we have the thyroxine right lack of thyroxine causes the goiter right there is significant swelling in the neck region right so that is where the thyroid gland is located and corticoids corticoids are the two different kinds of corticoids that we have which are released from the cortex that is glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids if there is any damage to this cortex of adrenal gland right cortex of the adrenal gland you have this disease called as edison's disease as a result of that there is lack of releasing of these two hormones that is glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids that is cortisol and aldosterone and growth hormone growth hormone which is released from anterior pituitary growth hormone which is released from anterior pituitary if there is over secretion of growth hormone in the middle ages middle ages leads to this condition called as acromegaly in acromegaly this person will have this huge puppy face long limbs and all of that will be there okay so those are the choices for us so based on that you can easily identify you know option a is the right choice for us this question is taken overall from the discussion of chemical control and coordination and the next uh, question that we have is so we need to match the following uh, you know options that have been given so this has been taken from the digestion and absorption uh, if you uh, if you have some reading about uh, the digestion and absorption of ncrt so really you would easily identify it the scripts of liver cone Scripts of labor cones. So these are the glands which are present in the small intestine to produce the intestinal juice. To produce the intestinal juice. And if you recall, what is the other name for intestinal juice? That is succus entericus. Right? Succus entericus is the name for the intestinal juice, which is secreted by the scripts of labor cone, which are present in the mucosal lining, mucosal lining of small intestine. And then we have this glissens capsule. So this is a fibrous capsule covering the lobules of liver. Right? So liver have functional units called as hepatic lobules, and these hepatic lobules are surrounded by this glissens caps. Sorry, liver. Right? Lobules of liver. So hepatic lobules. Now, islets, islets of Langerhans. So, islets of Langerhans, islets of Langerhans are the cells of pancreas, right? These are the endocrine cells. These are the endocrine cells of pancreas, right? These are the endocrine cells of the pancreas. Pancreas is the mixed gland, right? We have endocrine cells and we have the exocrine cells. Exocrine cells are the pancreatic SNR cells right pancreatic snr cells pancreatic snr cells yes those are the exocrine cells but islets of langerhans are the pancreatic endocrine cells then the brunner's glands brunner's glands are present in the submucosa layer submucosa layer of duodenum right submucosa layer of in the alimentary canal, the submucosa layer, you have these glands called as Brunner's glands, which produce the mucus, which produce the mucus, right? So that is uh, the options that we have. You can easily identify option A is the choice for us. Okay, option A is the choice. So we had we have seen ten questions, ten questions, and uh, you know. Uh, I'll be stopping here and I'll be further discussing the remaining questions. We have as many as 44 
questions have been given for the zoology segment and we'll uh, we'll continue uh, this segment in subsequent parts of this discussion so thank you thank you a lot please do subscribe i'll be making my best efforts to give you best information that is possible please do subscribe and press the bell icon thank you